Folks, I think a lot of times we get spiritually arrogant. I think we get spiritually arrogant. We think that we've got it all figured out. The Bible says, let him who stands take heed lest he fall. And it says that for a reason, because there's been many a person thought that they were standing on their own ability and they fell. And let me tell you something, I've been one of them. I've been one of them. I've had the old devil come along and yank the rug out from under me, folks, and I know that you probably have too. If you haven't, you will. If the Lord tarries long enough, you will. And you're going to find out, I'm not here to give the uh, devil any glory, but I will tell you, you don't take him for granted. You don't take him lightly. Because he is out there to steal, kill, and to destroy, and he's good at it. He's good at it, and he's done it to more than us. Folks, he's got a lot of practice. And we need to come, uh, we need to, uh, come against him, not in our own power. I'm going, now some of y'all, you'll recognize some of this from this morning. It's awful hard to, uh, sometimes when you prepare a sermon for Sunday morning and Sunday night, it's hard not to mix and match the two sometimes, um, and you pick a little verse or a little thought that's been running in your brain, and you blend Sunday morning and Sunday evening. Um, but in the spirit of what we've been dealing with in the Sunday evening service, and I talked to you all about this because as the backbone of the church, the core of the church, it's imperative that if we don't get it, nobody else is going to. And I'm not trying to pin a rose on your nose, and I'm not trying to elevate you, put, up, put you up on some kind of pedestal, but I will tell you this, that there are certain things, even the Lord said that there was, when He was talking to His disciples, there's a lot of things I'd like to tell you, but you just can't bear it yet. And there's a lot of things that I'd love to tell other people, but they're just not at that stage where they can accept or hear what needs to be said. And there, there is appointed unto people to whom much is given, of them much is required. And if God is working in maturity in your life, it is for a purpose and for a reason, and it may very well be that you're going to have to shore up the faith of someone else. And it may be, mean that you're going to have to chew on it well before somebody else gets a t chance to take a bite of it. Amen? Amen? I want to talk for just a few minutes this evening from uh, Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Very familiar passage of Scripture. We've talked about it, and you're probably going, Brother Ty, will you pick something else? But I've got a thought this evening, and it is such as I have. Such as I have. Yep, just talked about it this morning. But Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, if you found your place in the Bible, if you'll stand for the reading of God's Word, to honor God's Word, you probably don't even have to read it. You can probably quote it. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Such as I have. As I mentioned this morning, we cannot give what we ain't got. We cannot give what we ain't got. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your love and Your mercy. We thank You for Your Word. We know that Your Word is eternally settled in heaven. We know that there is nothing that Your Word can accomplish. It will accomplish what it was set forth to do. So God, I pray that this Word will be the nourishment that our soul needs, that we will gain the sustenance that we need to continue to fight for the kingdom, and that we will be able to do and be about the Master's business. God, I pray that you will show us what we need and give us what we must have to do the kingdom work. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. When 67-year-old carpenter Russell Herman died in 1994, his will, they read his will. In 1994, that's the year I graduated high school, um, 1994, his will included a staggering set of bequests. 
Included in his plan for distribution was more than $2 billion for the city of, San, of East St. Louis. Another billion and a half for the state of Illinois. Two and a half billion for the national forest system. And at the top, at the top of his list, Herman left $6 trillion to the government to help pay off the national debt. That sounds amazingly generous, except there was one small problem. Herman, Herman's only asset when he died was a 1983 Oldsmobile. He made grand pronouncements, but there was no real generosity involved. His promises were meaningless because there was nothing to back them up. It don't matter what you throw in the wheel. If it ain't there, it ain't there. It can't go to anybody if you ain't got it. <laughs> Today, we're inundated with empty promises and worthless commitments. If you could just have a nickel for every worthless promise, empty promise that was made to you, you probably wouldn't need them to make you any promises. You'd be independently wealthy. How many times have you been told something that turned out to be, well, I'm just going to tell you what I'm... I don't, I don't have a whole lot of gray area. If you tell me something that ain't true, then it's a lie. And I don't care what your intentions were. And I don't care how sincere you were. If you say it, and you can't do it, won't do it, don't do it, it's a lie. I don't see any other way to call it. Uh, we go along, our politicians have coined this phrase, misspoke. Which is a political way of saying I lied. But if you promise to do something that you cannot or will not fulfill, then it is a lie. Our government makes empty promises that it cannot keep and likely would not keep even if it could. Our education system promises what it cannot possibly deliver. Our education system promises that if you get your degree, that you'll get a job that'll take care... You can end up actually getting a degree and, and drowning in the student debt. They cannot guarantee that you will get a position. They cannot guarantee that you will reach a certain level of income. This, they make these empty promises. Now, what they do is they bank it on the fact that it is possible. But if it's not guaranteed and it doesn't come to fruition, it's empty, and especially in the case of the individual who goes through the program and does not achieve. Parents make promises to children that they can't guarantee that they can keep. Why do we lie to our kids? I was watching a movie the other day, an old, old western movie. And the Indians had run off with one of the girls, you know, that's... Uh, the Indians attack the settlement, take one of the girls hostage, and they go off looking for him, right? That's what they do. And before he rides out, he turns to his wife and says, I'll be back. And I'm going, I promise you, I'll bring our daughter with me. Well, of course he could say that because it was scripted. But in reality, he could not have made that statement. He didn't know whether he'd be back or not, much less whether he'd bring the girl home. See, these things are stupid. These are empty. These are they're empty promises. Instead of saying, I'll try, or I'll do my best, they make promises, which in, can end up being an actual lie. Good intentions make promises in love that is not in their ability to keep. And oftentimes, a promise that cannot be kept is a lie, plain and simple. When the church makes promises, it better be in touch with the God whose power can bring these promises to fruition. If we're going to make the claim, we better have the power to back it up. Otherwise, the church... You know why the church has become irrelevant in our day? It's because we are making promises we're not keeping. 
we're offering deliverance. And people ain't finding it. We're off, we're making promises, but we're not in touch deeply enough with God whose power is necessary to bring those promises about. So what we're left with is persuasive words, words of man's wisdom that lacks power, demonstration of the Holy Ghost, and we end up in many cases doing more harm than we do good. Well, Brother Ty, you're making big statements. You better be able to back it up. Well, folks, if you're watching and you're paying attention, there's a lot of talking going on, but there's not a lot of delivering. There's a lot of people that are talking about salvation. Let me tell you something. The church of God makes me do reports, and I have to put down on there whether somebody is saved. Well, first of all, I don't know whether a person's been saved or not. That's between them and their God. Because I've seen people hit the altar, cry crocodile tears, and go right back out into the world and never change. We make statements that, and the church of God watches this. And this, the church of God is just the only denomination I'm aware of. But I'm sure other denominations do the same thing. And they, t- they, they, they keep a tally of those coming in. But they're not watching the back door of those who are going back out. Hello? Why are they coming in? And then going out the same way. That, because we are not delivering on the promises that we are making. Our God is strong enough. Our God is big enough. But somehow in the middle we are losing the power that's being entrusted to us to make a difference for the kingdom. That's my, that's my take on it. You don't necessarily have to agree with me, but I do believe it to be true. There is no doubt that the need exists. No doubt in my mind that the need exists. In in the illustration of poor Mr. Herman who died and left trillions of dollars to... uh, What municipality wouldn't love to have a couple extra billion dollars? What city wouldn't say, yeah, two billion dollars would really help? It'd help our bottom line. Maybe they would find some way that they could put it into homeless shelters or be able to reach out to those who are in need. There are those who might be able to meet the needs of their poorer citizens. They would love that opportunity. Of course there is a need. We look at our government structures and though we recognize misuse, we can also see that sometimes some good is accomplished by these funds. Our government is fraught with malfeasance. But at the same time, there is some good things that happen through the money that goes out. There is health care and welfare and there's social security and there are educational grants and employment incentives. There are parks and preserves that are being taken care of. It's a noble task and money is necessary to do it. And folks, it would be nice to have a little extra money laying around it would be nice the need is definitely there and the Lord knows that it would be wonderful to be able to pay off the national debt it would be nice not to be not to lay that fiscal responsibility on the shoulders of our next generations but folks it doesn't mean a thing if the money isn't there to do the work that we say we're doing we in the church recognize that people have needs Not just them out there, us in here. We got needs too. We're people. 
We've got hard days and we've got bad days and we've got hardships and we've got troubles that come along and trials and tribulations. We've got cars that make rackets and we've got washing machines that quit washing and dryers that quit drying and stoves that quit stoving and dishwashers that quit washing dishes and the whole nine yards. We've got little things that go on in our life too, right? And we've got temptations and the devil don't like us none. So we've got all that going on too. And not to mention the fact that we have got the responsibility of carrying out the gospel into the world and shining the the light of Jesus Christ into a society that needs it. There is a need and we know that that need is there. People need healing. People need deliverance. I would say that we are probably more bound than any time In history. We need deliverance. Even Christians need deliverance. Well I got saved. Ain't that the deliverance I need? Well sometimes there are other things that are at work in your life that you need delivered from. Even Paul asked for deliverance from a particular thorn in his flesh. And God told him that his grace was sufficient for him because it was necessary to help keep Paul humble. But even believers have things that they desire to be delivered from. All of these are possible through the atonement, the atoning work that Jesus did on the cross. All of it, all the needs can be met. All the healings can be meted out. All the deliverance can be provided. Because Christ did the work on Calvary. But the problem is that sometimes we're taking this and we're wielding it around like some, like a child who has found some tool that we don't know how to use. We don't have the authority to use it. Jesus' blood purchased all these things. He made them available to the church. The power of the Holy Ghost is available to the church. Ever since Pentecost, the power of the Holy Ghost is available. And we have settled for crumbs instead of feasts. But what is available is not always guaranteed. What is available is not always guaranteed. Uh Uh-oh. I'm going to put it this way. I think the church has become awfully cavalier with what it throws around. When we make promises that are not up to us, I wonder if we cause more injury than we heal. There are many times that we make promises that were not up to us to make. Okay, where where am I going with this? First of all, we recognize that there is a need, but we also recognize that all these things are subject to God's will. Before we have a right to say anything, it must first be funneled through the lens of God's will. If God is sovereign... If God is the all in all, if God made us, created us, sustains us, then it really all relies entirely upon Him. Amen? James chapter 4 verses 13 through 17 says this, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. You've done made year by year plans and you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Well, what in the world am I supposed to say, James? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm going to tell you. He says, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. If He allows, then I'll do. 
There's nothing wrong with making plans. There's nothing wrong with having dreams or expectations. But at the end of it, you don't determine what happens tomorrow. That's up to God. And see, here's the thing that comes from that. It says, but now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. To know that it's not up to you, and yet say it anyway, it is an arrogance that we do not have a right to. It is wicked, it is evil for us. Many of us have quoted this particular verse, Therefore to, know, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And we recognize that, and we take that, lots of times we take that out of context. The context of that verse is in the previous verses that says that if you are boasting in your arrogance, that to know that you can't do that, and to do it anyway, it's a sin for you. My goodness how arrogant we are. To say, I'm going to do this, bless God, I'm going to do that. We're... I love to see these on people's uh, healing service this coming Sunday. Really? Congratulations. Congratula Congratulations. Let me pass, let me, let me point you to something because my brain looks, works a little weird. When was the beggar man laid before the gate? The Bible says, huh? Daily. 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 Beautiful. One little word, daily. wonder how many times Peter and John had went up at the hour of prayer into the temple. Huh? Hello? Y'all following where I'm going with this? Y'all picking up what I'm laying down? All right. Daily he was laid there. So how many days had he been there? Probably most of his life. Probably in his same little spot. That was his begging spot. And he'd been there every day, probably for years. And probably multiple times Peter and John had walked by, maybe flipped him a quarter and kept a walking. Many a time, many people had walked by and gave him a little something. Many times Peter and John had passed this man. But today was different. Why? Because the Holy Ghost unctioned them for something different than to just put a penny in the pot. Are you following what I'm saying? <laughs> there was something different that the Holy Ghost had to bring up. And not only did Peter and... The beggar man was there. Peter and John was there. And the Holy Ghost was there. They, they had walked by this man on a number of occasions. How many opportunities to be healed? We don't know. But we do know at least one. <laughs> what I'm trying to get at here is that we cannot dictate to God when these things will happen. We do not tell God, well, God, today I'm going to heal this feller. Really? Really? No matter how noble your intentions, no matter how high and lofty your ideals, you don't tell God what you're going to do and what you ain't going to do. We are the servant. He is the master. We are the slave. He is the Lord. We're the pot. He is the, uh, the, the potter. And it is not up to us to make these decisions. It's when He wills. James states that it is not in your control to even go about the general business of day-to-day -day life. How many times? Two weeks ago. Has it been two weeks? Maybe not even two weeks. I don't remember. Time goes... They blur one day into the next. The beatings just continue. But new job, this was my first 
first day of school, I was going to be at work and see what I could do to help out. And I was probably um, naively excited. Monday, I felt fine. I'd worked around the house, felt good. I was ready to tackle Tuesday. Monday night, I woke up and my head was spinning. I thought surely somebody had turned the speed control up on the planet and we were going around a little faster than normal. I took one of those tests and man, that China bug had got on me and I was sick as a dog all day Tuesday. Spent five hours in the emergency room. That was not what I had planned for my Tuesday. Folks, you can't control what happens to you tomorrow. You can't, happen what's going, you can't control what's going to happen to you between now and the time that this preacher hushes. They say nearly every second somebody on this planet dies. And do you reckon that they've planned it? It ain't in their control. You don't know what pitfalls or obstructions may hinder you. We're to qualify our statements with the recognition that our actions are predicated on the will of God. He may have other plans, and as His servants, we are at His mercy and His pleasure. The Bible says in Acts 17 verse 28, For in Him we live and move and have our being. I move when He tells me to move. My heart beats because He tells it to beat. I do because He tells me to do. And the minute He tells me that He's done, then I'm done. And there ain't a thing in the world I can do about it. We need to learn that while the need exists, and we have to look to see if we are operating in God's will, we have to also learn to take the Lord at His word. Jesus taught His disciples that the power He demonstrated would be at their disposal if they asked the Father in His name. John 14, verses 12 through 14 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on Me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto My Father." And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. But James comes along and gives us a little indication on that. We have not because we ask not, and if we ask, we have not because we ask wrong. That we can conceive it upon our own flesh, upon our own lusts. We want the glory instead of God getting the glory. Or, we want it our way instead of God's way. Folks, there have been many a person who thought that God wanted somebody to be healed. And it very well may be that God intended to use that person's sickness for His glory in a different way. And you don't know. I've heard people say, it's not God's will that any person is sick. Well, we blew that out of the water when we sinned in the garden. It was never God's will that man was sick, nor that he should die. But man blew that one out of the water by our sin. And ever since then, we have lived with the consequences of sin in our body. But that does not mean that God cannot get glory from our sickness. There was a man born blind. His disciples asked Jesus, whose fault is it that this man was born blind? Was it his mama's sin? Was it his daddy's sin? He said, nobody's sin, but this happened to this man so that he could show the glory of God. Do you know that there are people who are born with deformities that have a better grasp of the heavenly than me and you ever would? There are people who have been born who have mental uh, 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 disabilities that we look at them as disabled and we look at them as uh, uh, lacking in some area and they're happier than we are. 
And in many cases, they are a bigger blessing to other people than me or you ever will be. And when you ask them, they're not ashamed that God made them the way they are. Folks, what much, much what most of the time we're thinking needs to be accomplished is because it's what we want accomplished, not because that's what he wants accomplished. I'm wanting to see deliverances. I really do. I want to see God move. I want to. I'm wanting to see the church get back to a point where we are not satisfied with dribblings. We're not satisfied with sprinkles. We want downpours. Amen? We want God to open up the windows of heaven again and pour out blessings that we cannot contain. And I'm not talking about gold dust falling from the ceiling. I'm talking about the Spirit of God filling our hearts to where we can't contain it. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That's what I want to see. I want to see people come in who are bound by the devil and watch the power of God set them free. Watch the power of God turn them loose and shake the devil to his foundation, to his core. That's what I want to see. But the fact is, I cannot tell God what to do or when to do it or how to do it. What I must be ready to do is be available when He calls. Peter and John were on their way past the same beggar. And folks, there was one beggar laid at that gate. If there was one, there was 50. Because in that time period, that was where you put the beggar people. This word come to my mind. I don't know if it's a great word. It may not even it may be an ugly word that people in the church don't like. But there were people who kind of were like beggar pimps in that day. I don't know any other way to put it except for that they would take these people that were disabled, handicapped uh, beggars, and they would take them and carry them and lay them at these places. Then they would collect a portion of their alms that they would get, get. So if people put in $50, the guy who brought them there would take probably $30 or $40 of that and leave them with piddlings. You know, see what I'm saying? They did this as a living. The more beggars they had, the more money they made. When people, we see one beggar man was healed. There may have been 50 or 60 of them that weren't. Hello? Why do we... See, we get tunnel vision when we read the Bible. And we look at, well, there was a beggar man. I must have been the only one. And God, wow. That, nope. There was a whole bunch of them. And Peter and John had passed them all multiple times. But one day, God spoke to Peter and John and said, Today's His day. Amen? Today's His day. And many people have been in that same situation. Jesus has come along and touched people because that was their day. But the church has an imperative that they must be willing and able to hear when God says, today is that person's day. I think we've passed a lot of beggars on the side of the road when it was their day because we, and we just walk right on by them because we ain't hearing. We're not hearing what the Holy Ghost is saying. The Holy Ghost is saying, hey, stop. It's their day. And we're going, do 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 Because we got a sermon to preach and we got a song to sing and we got a, a Sunday school to conduct and we've got an offering to take up and we've got a program to keep going and we've got this to do and we miss when the Holy Ghost speaks. And that is the reason that the church... I, I, okay. I've called us to, uh, to fast. And... I started out with my mind going, I want to see miracles. I do. I do. I do. I do. I believe we can. I believe the same God that did miracles then can do miracles now. But what I'm starting to realize, and I can thank other people's wisdom, 
the Lord is pouring into them too. I've been in discussion with some of them. And they're reminding me that before miracles, you've got to hear the voice of the Lord. Maybe before we are seeing miracles, the miracles are right there. We're just not stopping to hear the the word of the Lord so that we can see the miracle. The miracle is the is the is the uh, we, the miracle, the deliverance. It's just the the result, the consequence of doing what we're supposed to do. It's just the just the side effect, if you will. Because the miracle was right there on the side of the road. If Peter and John hadn't have stopped, there would have been no miracle. Amen? I believe it. I believe that they had a choice, just like you do. I don't believe that God grabbed them, shook them, and said, do that right now. I believe that the Holy Ghost nudged their heart, and they had to be close enough to hear Him when He spoke. And maybe that's the problem with the church right now. We're just not listening. We're just not close enough to the Lord to hear Him speak and tell us, slow down and do what I've asked you to do. The Bible says, uh, Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 through 22, and I love this passage because it's it's when Jesus curses the fig tree. Right? Right? He's hungry, he comes, he finds the fig tree, no figs on it. And the Bible says uh, that he, uh, uh, well, here it is. Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? And you get this picture where Jesus goes, huh? He said, he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, this is small cheese. This is just a tree. This is not something of big major importance. This is just a fig tree. And he says, but also, if you shall say unto this man, and be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea. It shall be done in all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Well, I believe that God will remove the mountains of our burdens. I believe that if, he, if there is a reason for it, Table Rock could be in the ocean. I believe that with every fiber of my being. This is not talking about some kind of high lofty thought, some some theological premise. This is talking about nuts and bolts, brass tacks, rubber meets the road, real reality. That a mountain can be rooted up and cast into the ocean if God has a reason for it and you believe it can happen. And if you can pull up a mountain by the root and put it in the ocean, how much easier should it be for us to go about doing some of the things that God would have us to do to advance the kingdom? It should be we simply don't believe it. I'm a bit of a nerd. I like Star Wars movies. I like the old Star Wars movies. The old ones. I I just like them. And this guy's learning to, uh, there's, there's all kinds of weirdness that goes on. It's just fantasy. I like the swords, and I like the guns and stuff. All right. Anyway, he says, uh, this little dude, the little Yoda guy, he, he, and he picks up a spaceship, and he sets it out of the swamp onto dry ground, and Luke Skywalker's there, and he goes, I don't believe it. And Yoda looks at him and says, and that is why you fail. Folks, when we come before the Lord, we don't believe it. And that is why we fail. We don't believe it. We don't believe it can be done. We don't believe that people's minds can be cleared from the uh, rampage of the devil. We don't believe that they can be sobered up from alcohol and substances. We don't believe that the chains can be broken. We truly don't believe it. You don't want to know why, why I don't believe that most of us believe it? Because it ain't happened for us. 
I can tell you right now that if you've seen it happen in your life, you can believe it for somebody else. But most of us have not seen it truly emerge in our own life. True, I'm not saying you ain't saved. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying that many of us are struggling with and wrestling with problems that we've wrestled with most of our life. We've begged God to deliver us from them. He hasn't done it because we ain't really either begged right, <laughs> not begged, prayed correctly. We have not besought the Lord. We have not gotten down to business with God. And we haven't really believed that it could be possible in our life. And so it doesn't happen. And we don't believe it can happen for anybody else because it ain't happened for us. And then what we do, <laughs> the sad thing is when it does happen for somebody else, then we get jealous and we get frustrated and wonder, well, what happened to him? I've been Christian longer than he has. I've been praying longer than he has. Why can't I get? And folks, what it comes down to is we oppose ourselves. And we're not seeing the glory of God because we're not willing to submit ourselves. We don't believe it. And that is why we fail. Luke 11, verse 9 10, and I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. What I'm going to tell you right now is that when you seek, you don't need to seek your way. You need to seek God's answer. When I say I need, God, I need hundred bucks to make my mortgage payment. And then the, the check don't show up in the mail and we get upset because... God... Folks, look at the ways that God can answer prayers. I'm not going to tell you, I've had situations where I've had money show up that I didn't know where it came from and how it got there and wasn't expecting it, it just showed up. And I praise God for that, but more often than not, I have not received a check from heaven with God's John Hancock on it. You know what I've received? I've told you this before. God has made things last a lot longer than they should have. God has made things or given me the ability and the knowledge to fix something. That cost me $30. That if I'd have had somebody else to fix it, it would have been $300. You know what I'm saying? One day, Courtney had a little side saddle four-cylinder escort. She loved that car, and I loved to hate that car. It was a good little running car when it run. But by the time we got married, that thing was, oh my goodness. We'd be going down the road. I had to fold up in it. I just laid my chin on my knees. If we was in a car accident, they'd have found me in the trunk. <laughs> what was left of me. But we'd go around the corner, and if she took that curve too, short, too sharp, that thing would die. <laughs> My goodness gracious. Finally, I'd had enough, and I got out there, and I was working on the thing. It wouldn't crank. It wouldn't crank. Nothing I could do to get that stupid car to crank. What am I going to do? And it was dark, and it was cold, and I was mad. I was under the gun. We had to get, she worked, I worked. We had, had, we had two cars, mine and hers. And I was working by old Trouble Light. And they were aptly named because all they do is give you trouble. And I was sitting there banging my head in, under the hood. She walks out the door to check on me, and I finally got the car to crank, but it was button. What in the world wrong with that silly thing? She walks out, kicks the drop cord, the light goes out. Just about the time I about blow a gasket, I was about to come unglued, and I started seeing fire flashing. One of the spark plug connectors. They had long boots on them, hard plastic, and it had a hairline crack, and only when that engine got warm, that crack would open up and fire would fly out of it. If she hadn't kicked that light out, I'd have never saw it. 
And I was about to be so mad, and the Lord said, See, good things happen. I'd been praying, but I was still mad, and the Lord answered prayer. I'm going to tell you something. We've had refrigerators last longer than they should have. I've had cars last longer than they should have. I've had things work out better than it should have. And it wasn't because God sent me money, but God made things last. God works in ways that we're not expecting. I would have loved for Him to have sent somebody along and said, Here's a free car. But since He didn't, He did give me the ability to fix something. And I praise God for that. And if we weren't paying attention, we wouldn't recognize the blessings of God. We must ask without doubting. James verse one through, uh, chapter 1 verse 6. But let him that ask in faith, not, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. This implies a very close relationship with the Lord. The fact is you cannot give what you do not have. And I'll tell you this, simply speaking it does not make it so. Simply denying it does not get rid of it. Well, I speak in faith. Okay. But denying the existence of a problem does not make the problem leave. Actually, faith is recognizing that God is superior to the problem. Not that the problem doesn't exist. If I've got cancer, and I say I ain't got cancer, is that faith? I don't think so. My personal belief, you want to know what a statement of faith is? I've got cancer and God heals cancer. I've got cancer, but God's bigger than this cancer. I've got cancer, but if God wants to, He can use this cancer for His glory. And if He wants to take me out of this world, then it ain't going to be because of this cancer. It'll be because God's done with me. These are words of faith, but saying, I ain't got cancer. That's not faith. Real faith is recognizing that God is bigger than the problem. And speaking such, healing, the, gift, the gifting of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, is not our possession. The operation of of the Holy Spirit must be involved. All right. I believe that it's important. I'm going to finish up right here. That we desire to have what God gives so we can give what God wills. You follow me? I believe that it is important for us to be close enough that we desire to have what God has for us so that we can give what God wills for us to give. If a person needs healing, then we need to have that intimate relationship with God that we have what God wants to use in you. If God needs to speak a word through you, you need to know the word. Hello? Do you agree? Do you know that the Holy Ghost isn't just going to put that word into your brain? You're going to have to have it there so that the Holy Ghost can use it and pull it back out when He needs it. When He uses it. We contain God's Word. That's why I think Bible study is so important. That's the reason I still believe in Sunday school. That's the reason I believe in reading your Bible. And that's the reason I believe in preaching. I believe all these things are important. Why? Because we can't get enough of the Word. Because somebody's going to need that Word. And God's trying to get it into our thick skulls. So that one day, when He comes along and says, I need this, He can pull it back out of you. I believe the same thing for healing. I, say, I believe the same thing for deliverance. 
I believe that that is that God wants to pour into us His Holy Spirit so that when the time comes, He can use what, we, what He's already put in this vessel. He's put, we're, we're like a safe or a safety deposit box. We've got treasures in these earthen vessels. And God has filled us up with all these things and He's put us out into the world and He says, all right, now there's going to be a person that's going to need something I put in you. And I'm going to bring... Well, how did I end up over here? How did I end up over here? I needed you over here so I could give them what I put in you. But if we ain't got nothing in us, then we can't give nothing. Finish up right here. We do this through prayer, intimacy with the Lord, meditation, and fasting. When we refuse to quench the Spirit, when we refuse to quench the Spirit, when we recognize that the Holy Ghost is more important than we are, what He has come to do is more important than what we're here to do. When what He has to say is more important than anything we got to say, That's when we begin to allow the Holy Ghost to have the preeminence, when we allow God to move. But rather, we seek to allow Him to operate through us in His time. The title of my thought was, Such as I Have. As we pray, as we fast, as we seek God, we need to be asking God, fill up this vessel with something you can use. With something you can use. People are, people are praying for... This is opinionated. Maybe I ought to say it just seems like people are praying for like oh I want to be able to speak in tongues well maybe that ain't what God needs you to do do you see what I'm saying maybe speaking in tongues maybe he's got somebody he's got using for that maybe he needs you over here doing this maybe we need to stop asking God exact, telling God exactly how we want him to fill us and just tell him put something in here that you can use And then we might find that we're useful in His kingdom. But the greatest, the greatest thing that any of us, the, the greatest purpose that any of us can have is to be used in God's kingdom. For the Lord to have looked down and of, of 8 billion people on the planet and say, I got a job that I need tie to do. All these people running around, but this is the guy I want to do this job. And be ready to do it. Wow. I can't think of a greater purpose, can you? I can't think of a greater purpose than God to pick me. I was the guy that was picked last for football, basketball, volleyball, tennis. The last, I was the last guy picked for dodgeball. You got to be pretty bad to be picked last for dodgeball. <laughs> but for the God of the universe to look down and pick you, say, I want you. That sh- I can't think of a greater purpose. My hope and my prayer is that as we move forward, as this church grows, as we seek God, that we will begin to ask God. He will put something in us that such as we have, we can give. Amen. I'm going to challenge you as we have talked about the fasting and we've participated in that. I don't want you to let that go. I don't. Now am I going to tell you you need to fast every week? 
I'm going to tell you, you need to talk to God and find out how you, He would have you to proceed. I believe we're woefully behind. I believe we're woefully behind on, on that aspect of gaining the power of God. And I'm not going to tell you it's going to be easy, but I will tell you that it gets easier the more you do it. The first day, I'm so mean. Anybody else get that way? You get hungry and then you get mean. And you don't even want to be around yourself. And then you're really praying, God, please help me. Because right now, I'm not being good for nothing. <laughs> but then the next day, as, you've conquer, as you begin to conquer yourself, as you begin to gain mastery over yourself, as you begin to die and that spirit begins to live, you'll find that it becomes easier. Trust God. Strive to grow in the Lord. I believe we, we, can, we can see a whole lot of amazing things if we will just make these steps. To grow, our, to grow closer to the Lord. Amen. Well. Let's, let's pray. Let's pray. Father. Lord we thank you. For your love. We thank you for your grace. God we thank you that. You are a, an endless source of supply. Everything that anybody would ever need, you have. But God, we do recognize that we're limited and <laughs> things that other people need, we have to have put into us. If they need love, Lord, there is a supernatural love. But we don't all have it. And we need it from you. I pray, Lord, that you'll begin to deposit the things that you intend to use us for. I pray that you'll deposit it in these earthen vessels. Put those treasures in here, Lord, so that you can pull them out at the right time. And then we can say, such as we have, we can give. Because it was first given to us. It was first deposited in us. It was entrusted to us. Because, and then we have the, have the intimacy in our relationship with you to hear you when it's time to stop and open the door and allow that treasure to be withdrawn and used for the good and the benefit of another. We will see the miracles and the wonders and the signs that follow when we are simply obedient to you and listen to your voice and learn to hear you when you speak. God, I pray that you will birth in us an unquenchable desire to see no to allow, to allow you to use us in obedience, in, in seeking your will, in, our, in a close relationship with you, that we'll allow you, that we will... We will learn not to doubt. and We'll learn to have faith and to trust you. And then we know that we'll begin to see things. We'll begin to be used. And, and it may very well be, Lord, that by that point, we're no, longer, we're no longer as interested in seeing as being used. And we'll fulfill the very highest purpose that any believer could ever have, and that would be that we have been found useful for the kingdom of God. Lord, forgive us where we fail. Be patient with us as we learn and as we grow. God, if we bring offense, Lord, I pray that you will soften it. 
But Lord, if it's Your Word, I pray that we will be quick to recognize where the offense came from and that we will be easily, easily remedied by the balm, by the ointment of the Holy Ghost. Lord, bless us as we go our separate ways. We don't know what's in store for us, but You do. So I pray, God, that You'll keep us safe and that You'll bring us back at the next appointed time. And should You come for us or call for us in the meantime, may we be found worthy by the blood of Jesus Christ to stand in Your presence, knowing that our sins have been washed away.